And uh, I did Ashtanga yoga for quite some time. Unfortunately, I, my, I had let my practice go a little bit over since I started the, the company. Um, but I used to get up at sort of like 4.30 in the morning and get to the yoga shala at 5.30. And Ashtanga is kind of like a militant practice. There's no, there's no teacher that guides you through the steps. You have to learn it and you only learn up to your ability. And then you get gifted a pose as you get better and better and better. So that was sort of my, my zenith at that moment to try and get there. It's, it's gone downhill. There's, there's one thing that you learn in, in yoga is that you will always be bested by an eight-year-old girl. So just forget. <laughs> and is, like, it, it, it's the non-attachment to the pose. <laughs> oh, that is so good. So Dorian, um, you, we were just at a meeting where you said, where the, the catchphrase of that particular group was, you got to live it to lead it. Yeah. And every time that I get a chance to talk with you, we peel away another layer of the Dorian onion, which includes things like a um, massive database of knowledge on uh, wine and wine qualities. But today learning that, um, you know, your yoga practice, you're really, you really are a guy who, despite being an entrepreneur, you're out there trying to truly live it to lead it, right? Well, you know, I think... You, you know, you have to change yourself first. You know, um, you know, I think there's a military thing is you've got to look after your gun. You've got to look after yourself first before you can look after anybody else. And that's, that's the number one uh, kind of piece. And you know, when back in 2015, when I was 207 pounds, um, you know, I was in the fog. I was, you know, I was on antidepressants. And my, my job was in the toilet. And that, that was when I made the change to go, to go keto. And, you know, once you make the change, you have to, you've got to dive in there all the way. And um, not only in your lifestyle, but also in making sure that you can take care of yourself so that you can take care of, of others. And uh, so that's kind of like where I, I find myself at that stage. And uh, yeah, I really, I miss my yoga practice. I've got to, I've got to try and get back to that. I do, I do swimming and hot tubbing right now, just to get that hour of peace in my business life. But uh, a little bit more, a little bit more hours in the day would be nice and more sleep. So I, I balance sleep against trying to, maybe lifting weights will be the next thing to do. Oh man, I, I love the anti-sarcopenia movement. And I just got to be honest, on the camera that you're using, that cup of Joe looks like a giant bowl, porcelain bowl of Joe. It, it, it is. This is actually my second cup of tea of the, um, of the day. And it is the size that you see it. I, I drink a gallon of tea a day. <laughs> Let's see what's in there. What's in the cup today? What kind of tea? It, it, it is PG Tips, a typical English workman's tea with heavy cream. Uh, okay. You're uh, an authority. Being English yourself, and in, in, in rather than me introduce you by your first and last name, what I would love is for you to do, do the impersonation of your siblings from the UK, how they would individually say your name. <laughs> this cracks me up. You, you did this in Nashville. So how would each of your siblings say your name? Well, you know, my, my family have spread across the globe. I've got my brother is um, um, was a personal chef from Rizzio Gucci, and he um, traveled around Europe in France, Italy, and now lives in Sweden. And my, my sister, she uh, married a boat engineer, and uh, she went off to New Zealand. So she has this up inflection at the end of the name. And then my other brother moved to the northern north of England now. We all came from the south of England, so I have a south of England accent, or so I think I have. But when we get together, it's sort of my, my sister has this Kiwi up inflection. My brother sounds like Euro trash with push, push this, and he's got all this other stuff. And then Richard, he turned into a Birmingham kind of guy. He's got this northern nasal kind of thing going on. You're like, what the f is that? You know? <laughs> and I'm like thinking, I think I sound like the only English person left of my family. But perhaps when I get home and I listen to my friends again, they'll go like, nah, you got a middle Atlantic draw. So, so how, how would each of them pronounce your name? Well, if I was going to Wales to visit my father, they would go Dorian. Dorian Cariadius is super tough. My name is Dorian Greno. Now, that's a very hard way to say it in Welsh because Greno, you have roll your R's a little bit there. But most people go with Dorian Green out. It's the best way to kind of like do it. Including your siblings? Uh, well, my siblings will probably call me by my nickname, which I won't reveal here. Oh, 
<laughs> that family kind of thing, the nickname that you really, really hate, and your brothers and sisters always call you by it because they can. No need to advertise it. As, <laughs> as the founder and creator of uh, Keto Mojo, I just want to let the audience um, in on a little uh, insider secret that I found out, which is if you look at this cool logo, you see a yoga influence there, yeah? Yeah, totally. That was, um, that's Warrior One that's going on there, but with the hand going up on the other piece there. So yeah, there was a little bit of that at, at the time for the, for the creative. You, see, you can see, you see the genesis of it that comes into play. Why do you have a photograph of me trying to, to do that? And at one stage, we were going to actually spell out Keto Mojo in human bodies that were doing different poses um, uh, like it. Yeah, uh, but we were thinking on that for the website, but we moved away from that. Um, you might get people laying on a beach and then you do a drone flyover or something. I could see that, right? Um, uh, yeah, there's a, there was a classic bl um, black and white photography of done of gymnasts spelling out something. And I was taking that as to um, uh, the different pieces and people were actually um, like, um, if you if you do upward bridge, that means you're lying on your stomach. You know, some gymnasts can hold on to their feet and therefore basically that's your O. Um, uh, and so you can work with your arms to make the, the keto as, as a lowercase K with, with your hands and feet. So that, uh, we did actually work on trying to do that, but didn't look good for, for graphics. Our theme this month is looking at the, the psychology of di uh, dieting at Arise mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the average American goes on and off five diets in a year. Mm -hmm. We're now in this era of what I call the prescription diets. And in my practice alone, we have the full spectrum of just doing healthy substitutions, but you still have a slightly healthier version of the SAD, the standard American diet, to going low carb, to going paleo, um, to eventually going keto. And then we live in the era now where you've, we've actually, you can have your protein bar and fool your body um, with the fasting mimicking diet, right? Which uh -huh. is almost oxymoronic. In there comes this awesome tool that is quite a high value and is um, something I recommend to a lot of my intense athletes and those who want to go from just being paleo to truly proving that they're, they're in ketosis. Why did you create this? Give us a little bit of the backstory. Uh, well, first of all, let me say, I think keto is a pres pre prescription strength diet. I mean, let's be very clear of the, the use that this can do is actually in some cases better than some pills, especially for epilepsy, and has been used for over 30 years as, as a great control for that. But if you come back to you know, where I was speaking, where now back in 2015, when I was saying I was 207 pounds, a good friend to me said, you know, you've got to give up those white devils. Well, he actually said he was from the South. So I'll try and do a South accent. He's going, he goes, like, give up those white devils, white devils. You've got to cast them out of your life. Uh, very much like a preacher. And I'm like, what are you on about? I don't do fad diets. I don't do any diets. I'm, an, I'm, a, you know, I'm a working class Englishman. You know, I don't do this kind of thing. But I started reading up on the science that was behind it. And, you know, I was looking at, uh, what the work that Taubes had done, Volick and Finney. Uh, I read the, the books that Jimmy Moore had, had put on out. I'd looked at what Angela Stanton had written on the Stanton Protocol. I'd looked at what Dr. Nasha Winters on, on the metabolic approach to cancer and Miriam Calamian. And the more and more that I read into this, the science seemed to be very evident and very clear that this was more of an optimal way of, of living your life. So I um, was using... I, I do what I call lazy clean keto is I just eat whole keto foods. There are no bars. Um, and the reason why I, I personally do this is I found out by using a meter and I was using the competitors at that time that I actually have an insulin response, but not a glycemic response to artificial sweeteners and sugar alcohols. And so that insulin response would suppress my, my ketones down. And at that time I was on antidepressants and I found that I could come off my antidepressants if my personal ketone zone was between 1.1 and 1.7. And so over a period of six months, my weight went from 207 pounds down to 165. 
Um, I was very active at that stage, um, but in the last two years, I've, I've seen an increase of maybe about nine pounds on my weight, but I've kind of like hit a, a set point. And all I do, and I was testing to the meter, and I was finding out what foods work for my bio-individuality. And I never even counted carbs after the first month. After that, I just knew, you know, I tested I was in ketosis. I tested I was in ketosis. I knew what I was doing was right. So these days I do curiosity testing and, and it's mainly for wine because my wife is a sommelier and we love to drink across all of the wonderful wines that are, are in, in Europe and around the world and we want to know which ones we can do. Hopefully one day there'll be truth in labeling on, on the back end of a wine that everybody will know but until we do we, we test a bit to know. And I, live want on. I want to tap your brain on the wine topic in a minute but to be clear, you are not, this device does not check insulin. No, what we do is you can, it measures glucose and it measures ketones. And if you see glucose spike, you can use that as a proxy for insulin, um, but it does not measure insulin. So when I was first measuring, strips were like $4 a pop from Abbott. And yeah. it bothered me so much. I, I'd like, I pulled out this and why the hell is this little thing, $4, right. uh, the strip? And so, you know, I took it apart. Yeah, I took it apart. You can, you'll see there's about three laminated layers, three to four laminated layers that are in there. And, um, and then there's a circuitry, there's gold on, on the base there um, uh, to, to act as, a re, as a, on the, uh, the non-reactive agent and the it's circuitry. It's a cool little device, you know? Yeah. I like the, uh, also, if you look at the, um, the, if you can pull out the glucose strip, you can see the circuitry on the, on the back of the glucose strip, which is kind of cool. I don't know. Do you have one there? Oh, yeah, look at that. Yeah. You can see that there is two circuits on that piece, one that measures hematocrit, one that measures the glucose, and then there's the fill um, line at the end to make sure that we're getting the full um, dosage of um, uh, blood in, in the blood sample uh, in there. How did you, Dorian, how did you figure out that although you weren't having a glucose spike or a glycemic response, you were having an insulin response? Because I would see my ketones curtail and go down. I would get a baseline in the morning an hour after waking and after measuring many, many times, I knew what my baseline was. Then about an hour or so after eating, I would, if there's something new, I would measure both my glucose and my ketones. And if I had seen that, that um, ketone level go down slightly, that would say, hey, something's here. And I would test it again and go, like, all right, I'm going to now test at two hours and three hours and four hours to see whether or not I had an insulin response that signaled to the liver to say stop producing ketones, but didn't have a glycemic response that pushed up by that. Sorry, I got my dogs barking in the background over there. <laughs> right at home. No worries. This is, I think this is an overlooked aspect of um, what we call building your bio-individual glycemic index. Yes. The, the, the memory I have from med school is hearing that first data. I think we got a total of four hours of nutrition in med school. I'm glad that another doctor admits to the fact that they don't get that much nutritional um, uh, training. Four hours of nutrition, four hours on sleep, and four days on your student loans, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and I went to dental school first when we got a business lecture one hour every week. Um, but you're, you're, uh, the question is, um, is the glycemic index teaching that we historically pass on you know, through, through the decades, is it, um, does that apply to everyone? And what I found out after my med school lecture uh, I went and challenged, which is a, a green apple is going to be more glycemic friendly than a red apple. That was the, t that was the rule we were given. Well, I went with, I got a glucometer and went and over the next week randomly checked after a green apple and after a red apple. And I'm just the opposite. Yeah, there's a, um, a, there was an Israeli study, I think done on about 840 respondents that um, attested people to a banana and to a cookie and everybody had a different response. Uh, and so that's where we really comes down to the bio individuality is what we've got to kind of like take a look at. And so, you know, when I see people say the 20 gram carb rule, is that net, is that total? Um, some people say 777 seven, seven carbs. Some people say, was well, it 35 grams of carbs? Well, what if you can be in a state of nutritional ketosis at 55 grams of carbs? Um, you know, the trying to treat people, trying to use the lowest common denominator well, that was invented because testing was expensive. 
But since Keto Mojo has had a market forcing function and we've changed the price from being $4 a strip down to a buck a strip, which is, you know, I, I say my, my business plan was on the back of a cocktail napkin, test three times a day for less than the cost of a latte. I went to a hundred manufacturers and you'll be surprised how much some manufacturers don't think, don't know what the cost of a latte is. And then you've got all of the balance of systems costs, which you've got like the middlemen and the distributors and everybody wants their hand out saying like, give me cash, give me cash. When we shouldn't be thinking about this, we should be thinking about how do we change people's habits to make them healthy. And I look at it that people test a lot for the first 60 days. Then yeah. after that, they, they've changed the way they, they live. They've learned what is right for them. They test their inketosis, they test their inketosis. They don't need me anymore. We're only the training wheels in life. And if they don't buy another strip from me, I'm happy because our job has been done. Now my competitors, they'll want you to be a diabetic for the rest of your life because that's good money because you'll be testing six times a day. And guess what? You won't get any better and you will probably lose a limb or go on to dialysis and you'll have, 10 to, you'll have maybe 15 years less life. I think that's horrible. You know, uh, why should it that a husband and wife team can go up against a Fortune 500 company and try and change things? That's not right. And that's not what, this, what we should be doing. Um, and you know, that's what we're, we're about to do. My goal is if I can get scale as a company and drive down the cost, Obesity rates are skyrocketing in second and third world countries because of cheap carbohydrates. That's being pushed in by larger countries. Um, the farming techniques are being pushed in by larger company, companies. Subsidizing of, uh, of corn, soy, and wheat is, is causing an obesity epidemic in, in America. And, and across the globe. And our goal is how do we reduce that down to give the tools so that across the globe we can make a, a healthier world and ultimately change the farm bill, uh, especially in America. I think the farm bill is a much maligned piece of a legislator. It's boring, nobody looks at it, but if we can change that, we can change the health of America and potentially the globe. And hopefully that little device there can be a, a little part of the catalyst to have that kind of market forcing function. I mean, that, that's our ultimate goal. It's when my wife and I have already set up a foundation to fund clinical trials and studies and the efficacy and the use of ketogenic diets for the benefit of mankind. Um, the investment for the monitor is roughly what? Base cost is like 60 bucks, but I get some strips on that, another 60 on, onto that. So you're in for a 60 day supply there of about $120. Uh, ish something like that um and so, one of the most expensive prescriptions out there well yeah i mean if you look at insulin uh is the seventh most expensive liquid in the world and even somebody who's a type one diabetic now there's always people that said like well if you're a type one diabetic you got to be careful about going keto be very careful about low carb there was always the warnings of ketoacidosis that we used to, to hear um but you know if you look at the, what the um bernstein protocol uh, Dr. Bernstein and you know, going to groups like Type 1 Grit on Facebook, there are children and adults who have reduced their insulin load by 70%. And they're no longer on this roller coaster ride of pits and troughs where they're trying to manage it. They have a, a constant, nice, and low um, uh, blood glucose. It's steady, it's managed. And even some Type 1s who still had. Um, some form of insulin being produced from their pancreas could actually come off and go either for oral insulin or even actually come off because they kept it down low, which I think is fantastic. Um, more doctors should be taking this on and then actually more insurance companies because what happens if they could reduce the cost by 70%? If I was an insurance company CEO, dude, I'd be going out that like you've got no idea of business. I would be going after health and preventative so that we didn't have to have so much cost that we're paying out. You could make the margin spread on the, on the, on the, on the person's premiums. But I can tell you yeah. that um, we're, we're big fans of this. And as a clinician, I think you're absolutely right that, uh, that physicians in America are underutilizing these particular diets because you can now assess and address, right? We're not sending yeah. people out blindly. What I want to ask you, though, is that as soon as you talk about type 1 or 
advanced type two diabetics doing extensive fasts or trying to go keto, um, in, in my allopathically trained brain, I have immediately have a, uh, uh, what we would call in Malaysia, awas, a caution, a cautionary sign. Yeah. Well, first of all, if you are type one or type two, do it under provisions of a doctor. Um, absolutely. Uh, especially if you're on any form of medications, because when we talk about it being a prescription strength diet or lifestyle, that's true. Uh, one of the, the challenges for anybody who starts to, um, who is a type two diabetic who's on medications, especially in those first days and weeks is managing um, their medications because as the, their blood glucose levels come down quite rapidly, they don't want to be at a higher strength. That needs to be dropped down, and that definitely needs to be under the provision of, of, a, of, of, a, of a doctor that understands it. Um, there is Verda Health in San Francisco. Um, we have partnered with them to provide meters to them, but they were the first company to clinically prove that you could reverse the effects of type 2 diabetes with a well regulated ketogenic diet. And that was started by Sami Inkanen, who owned Truilia Real Estate, sold it to Zillow for about 3.5 billion, whilst he was rowing across the Pacific with his wife, beating the world record on a ketogenic diet, as you do because you're an A-type. Uh, <laughs> look at that going like, holy cow, how do you do that kind of like thing at the same time? I'm so on this Friday. <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, like, I'm trying to sleep on in, you know what I mean? And, uh, and then he was, he, because he was a triathlete, he was wondering why he was getting pre-diabetic and he was carbo-loading. And then he read the works of Wallach and Finney, and that was when the light bulb moment for him came on, saying he reversed his pre-diabetes, his athletic performance went up, and then he realized that he could actually do some good in his life. And that's why he set up Verda House and got a lot of money and spent all of that on the clinical trials and studies, which, you know, fair play to him. I mean, that's a, a huge amount of outlay to get there. And I really hope that he succeeds in, in his mission in reversing type two diabetes across the globe. Um, it's, a, it's a lofty goal. It's a, uh, the, the layman's term is this idea of a pancreatic or insulin sensitivity reset, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is a really exciting concept, but I want to underscore the fact because I am somebody who's prone to hypoglycemia. My grandfather is as well, my mother is, that um, it really needs to be done under the supervision uh, of a physician. And yes. what, what we do is I use, uh, and this is a, a segue into talking about the different way technically that these devices measure the blood sugar. Um, but we use a continuous glucose monitor simultaneously out of the gate with education to help people understand a how foods macro and micro affect your body and then b what what is actually happening with you as you take photos of your food and then we can look every 15 minutes for 14 days at what how how your body responded to those foods that's and fantastic it is such a powerful accelerator for a process that well <laughs> Uh, would take the average American years to figure out on their own, right? Yeah. Then once we've accomplished that, if they're psychologically motivated and they start to see the gains, better sleep, better focus, um, they, they want to try going off their ADHD meds. I mean, the cascade of events that can come out of a low glycemic diet and moving towards keto, it's just incredible as a clinician to watch people transform. Absolutely. What you love, and you went through this, but you see it also, you mentioned going off your antidepressants, but you literally see people come into more of the version that, of, of themselves that they were meant to be. Yeah, I, I kind of like to say that I got the joie de vie of well, well, how I felt when I was 24 and could take on the world. It sort of like came back to me, you know, and that at, at 45, you're like, well, hey, you know, what, what, wow. You know, now to the flip side of that, you know, when, you know, I, I was um, Dr. Um, Christopher Palmer, um, uh, he's a psychologist. He gave a great lecture at um, a low carb USA in San Diego. You know, we, we, most people in the keto world have always had that like, yeah, I got loads of energy and I'm doing really great. Well, in somebody who has a psychological condition, we have to be careful about hypomania here. Mm -hmm. And this is where, you know, when we talk about a prescription strength lifestyle, yeah, that does need to be monitored in certain sections of, of the population. Absolutely. 
in other sections, you know, people like me, it's absolutely fine. I, I could do it all on myself. But, you know, if somebody suffers from hypomania, next thing you know, they've just gone and spent $50,000 that they don't have, or even worse, started harming themselves or something else, then, then you've got a, a, an, an issue there. But the advances that we're seeing in neurological disorders for ADHD, uh, PTSD, um, traumatic brain injury, um, we're seeing Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, um, this is really exciting um, stuff that is going to be coming on on out just in, in just a pure neurological area and obviously Dr. Walls and what she's doing with um, the Walls protocol and multiple sclerosis is fantastic. We see what's happening in oncology, uh, especially with um, uh, GBM and, and other forms. Uh, what we are currently seeing now, um, we're, we're assisting uh, in a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease trial at Cedar sinai Hospital. Uh, they can see changes in little as 14 days in, in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Yeah, we're talking about both serum enzymes and on CT scan, the, the, the actual organ changing. Precisely. Uh, and so what we, we provided our meter and strips for them to do a 30-day trial. They were providing all of the food and then doing CT scans on, 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 on a regular basis. And change is happening in 14 days. That's amazing. Then if you look at, you know, there's emerging evidence for Lyme's disease. There's emerging evidence that we see for cardiovascular. We're seeing things with Rett syndrome. Uh, and you take a look at, at a huge other number of, and obviously obesity and type two diabetes and all the, the metabolic syndrome issues that come out of that. I mean, oh, I don't know if you heard Nina Teicholt speak at, uh, I think it was Metabolic Health Symposium. And there are over 75 peer reviewed studies that have been put forward for um, the ketogenic lifestyle. There's not one for veganism. And the ones that they had used for um, uh, the standard American diet, uh, one of those was actually discredited. Um, and that had like three to 5,000 respondents that was into it. So, you know, the data set that is emerging is getting so big, but we need more. And that's why we have the foundation wants to fund more clinical trials and studies. Because I think once you just have this body of scientific evidence, it becomes irrefutable. And then once it's irrefutable and then the doctors start changing what they're, they're looking to do and then people start shopping the outer aisle, you'll have a market forcing function on how people buy things and then growers will, will change. And ultimately, maybe our government will decide to change the USDA guidelines on food. Maybe. But that's a governmental thing and they're always the last to get there. <laughs> Usually. Dorian, we... When I first came back from Borneo about three years ago, I was very antagonistic. I jumped on the bandwagon of the U.S. system is broken, big pharma's ruling, all the low-hanging uh, negative antagonistic fruits. I was plucking them one after another. I, I now think that that's really not a great use of time. In fact, it's counterproductive. You know, the U.S. healthcare system was never put forth to be a preventative medicine system. Mm -hmm. In the post-World War I, World War II era, we basically brought that green mash tent home and, re and constructed, you know, brick around it and put porcelain boxes inside, called them operating theaters, called them emergency rooms, and called them intensive care rooms, right? It, it, two, two to three percent of the U.S. spending each year, which is $3.7 trillion, goes towards prevention. So mm -hmm. one of the inconvenient truths in all of this is that most of the responsibility for your health fate truly lies in your hand. Oh, yeah. Even the CDC and P, which people forget that prevention there on the end, says that 80% of chronic diabetes, heart disease, dementia is related to your lifestyle choices. Yep. However, how much of a threat does this really pose to that $3.7 trillion industry? Well, here's the way I, I my, my, this is my personal view on it and that people need to take obviously control of their own lives. This is the classic rugged American individualism. You know, you, you pull yourself up from your bootstraps, you are responsible um, for yourself. The challenge for people that we do that is um, there are those that live in food deserts um, through they are impoverished and they might not have access to the same kinds of information that you and I have access to. Um, that when they grow up, they're shown because of the, the USDA guidelines that this is a healthy meal and it shows that pizza is apparently a vegetable 
and it's good for you um, by the USDA guidelines because it's got plenty of carbs there. Um, and there are some vegetables, I believe, sometimes on them. And, you know, you kind of like look at that and they're, they're, there's this brainwashing from an early age that says you've got to have these six meals a day. And here you've got to have this 1% or 2% sugar laden chocolate milk because kids obviously can't have normal high fat milk or that would be terrible um, to, to, to do those things. And, you know, so there is a certain amount of brainwashing. But there is a bottom up and a top down movement right now that are beginning to get that critical mass. We're already seeing in supermarkets that the, the center of the supermarket is down by over 1.2%, which in, is a lot uh, for people that are not buying those carbohydrates. I went to a local restaurant and there was keto eggs and they actually said the word keto on a, on a, on a menu. And so what will happen is eventually is that we will see slowly, bit by bit, these things will change. Just like, yeah, we can have gluten-free. It's easy to go to a restaurant and say, hey, I need something gluten-free. I think what you'll find is that chefs will learn how to say, yeah, I can do a keto-friendly version of this. The burger without the bun. The um, eggs benedict without the, um, without the, um, uh, the, the muffin, if you, if you will, on, on that one in the, in the morning. And we'll have a market forcing function and that will change the way the farmers will market and it will change the way that we go. And I, I love the work of what Peter Ballastet has done uh, of the Ruminati. Uh, I don't know if you know of his work because yeah. you know, when people, people talk about, well, how can you have an agrarian society that is built upon people eating um, protein? You know, that there's the, the argument of the, ve of the vegetarian side saying, no, we need everybody to be vegetarian to be able to feed the globe. Well, when they talk about the protein, there are always incomplete proteins. And if you actually did a proper study on it, you would realize that you actually need more land to grow complete proteins for a vegetarian diet than you would if you were using cattle or, um, or, or types like that. And realize that cattle don't eat our food. So they're not in competition for our food. Cattle do not grow, uh, cattle, you don't grow a, a cow on an annual crop. You actually grow it on a perennial crop, which means the roots go down really deep, which means you have a great mycelial mat that will filter the water and they can work on slopes and hillsides that we cannot grow our crops on in the way. And because you're now protecting the watersheds, uh, you have a better quality of, of meat and you also have um, a better production system. And then people will say, well, look at the methane farms that are produced on, down in, on the 101 I-5 down to in California and those concentrated animal feeding operations. Well, yeah, they're disgusting. They're horrible. That is not how an animal should live. That's not how the food we should be eating. So it's not the cow. It's the how. Because there are more animals on the Great Plains than we ever had in an animal density or even right now. And I, that's why I like the work of what Joel Salatin is doing at Polyface Farm uh, and looking at what permaculture is. Because I th think we can change the farming paradigm and how we grow. So I've got a cat that's like chewing on my toes right now. <laughs> I can uh, No problem. Welcome to Cat to the Show here. Oh my yeah, God. There we go. That's Lucy. There we go. What a treat. Is, is Lucy keto? Uh, actually, all our animals are. They are all on a raw food diet and have been since um, uh, they started. No gum disease problems. Um, Kush is like um, 11, 12. He goes for a checkup once uh, a year. Absolutely doing really well. So Suka's um, up four. And, uh, Lucy's um, uh, getting on for about 10, but full, fully raw diet. They, they have raw chicken necks, raw chicken feet, pulsed in egg, egg shells in there a little bit, uh, add in some um, pulsed herbs and they love it. Yeah. And super lean, no obesity problems and the poop don't smell. Very good thing. Really? It's, it's a weird thing. Uh, and I, sorry, I always got to talk poop with the doctor, haven't you? Um, uh, but what happens is uh, their poop, um, uh, comes in out, it's a lot smaller. Then actually it just goes in the summertime, it just goes white and then crumbles down uh, into powder and disappears. And if you contrast that to kibble, that kibble poop stays forever and doesn't break down and absolutely stinks. Um, the smell of their coat is different. There's, um, in, in, in wine terms, like uh, Italian wines have this animale is what they call it. 
and their, their, their coat smells different too. So, you know, I just, it's nice to have the dogs around because my house doesn't smell doggy uh, at, at all. And uh, it's, it's better for their health. But yeah, we've been raw food for the last, oh, I don't know, 12. Well, actually, Bessie was older. So like 15 years, yeah. Have you noticed your own body odor change when you went from being over 200 and some pounds to keto? I think that would, that would be a question for my wife probably. <laughs> I mean, I'm a guy. What do I know? Do I sniff my armpits? I don't know. Um, maybe a little. <laughs> Let me bring you back to the technology for a minute. So we talked about, we use Abbott's Libre Pro um, continuous glucose monitor. Yeah. Which for those who don't know, it, it's a really brilliant design. When you take that thing off and look at the underside of it, mm -hmm. it flips this micro catheter just under the epidermis. And uh, through capillary action, it's able to draw up a little bit of blood. Um, so we use that initially with people. And then this is an obvious finger stick. And the questions that come up are, how are these technologies different? And then what's the accuracy on these? So, uh, you, know, the, you know, obviously they're all federally regulated to, to conform to the norms that is, is required. So the FDA allows you to be within 20%. Um, the International Standards Organization allow you to be within 15%. But you've got to kind of like think about it like archery. And if you compare one reading to the next reading, uh, that's one archer putting one arrow in on the, uh, on the, on the meat. And um, sorry, my phone went in the middle of that. Uh, and so that's an archer putting it onto, onto, the, onto the target. But really that archer has 20 arrows in its quiver and you've got to take a look at it at arrows over time to get a defined, to take a look at the accuracy. You know, with a CGM, I think the patches are roughly about, I don't know, $79. I think if you were going to try and buy them and then the actual, the, the meter cost is usually subsidized under insurance. So, you know, when we think about having a 10 day uh, and you've got a two day calibration period and a two day off period, you still got to use a finger stick in those two days. So that's definitely something for an affluent market like America and, and Europe. Um, and, but what I, what I looked at, I was like, if I can bring the cost down so we can go and make it more accessible to people and realize that we only test a lot to begin with and after a while we don't need it, then you have to ask yourself, is there a greater market for maintaining with the fingerprint state or how can we, um, you know, th is there a limited continuous glucose market because that's really for a type one rather than all of those metabolic diseases. And so personally right now, I've moved down, like how do I bring the cost down? We've looked at CGMs, the IP on that is, is really, really great. Um, and they've got a great, did a great job on their, uh, on their patents. So it gives them a stranglehold on price for a while and means that they won't make it more democratic and bring down the cost, um, which is a bit of a sadness for the, for the world. Uh, Agreed. Is it, is it possible to do ketone monitoring in that technology that exists already, the CGM technology? Not that I know, because mainly on, on the CGMs, it's using the interstitial fluid um, glucose that is in the skin. That's the calibration time is, is the infusion of the glucose into the skin. And then when you're measuring um, ketones, you're actually measuring the ketones in the blood, in, in, the, in the, that capillary f um, fluid that is coming through. Um, so you would still need a needle to go on basically in there and for it to be able to test over time with the enzyme as it, as it rolls on off. I haven't seen any technology yet. And uh, if I ever get the money to be able to do it, I'd certainly take a look at it. But the question is, is you are either are in ketosis or you are not in ketosis, like being pregnant. No woman is more pregnant than another woman. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you know, it's about your bio-individuality and learning what's right with you. But at the end of the day, you shouldn't be living your life to a meter. You should use it as a training tool to get you to your optimal life. Yeah, to take the candy shell off of who you are and, and yeah. to emerge, thrive, and feel that good again. Yeah. Switching gears real quick, the, uh, there is dry uh, farms wine out there that is talk, is, is the first in line to say we're a keto friendly uh, wine um, distributor. Um, you made a comment to me in Nashville. You said, you know, I love those guys. I love Todd, you know, but with a little bit of knowledge, people 
can select keep more keto friendly wines. Can you give the listeners a couple of tips on selecting a keto friendly wine? Because we, I've got a lot of wine consumers in my practice. <laughs> sure. You know, this is sort of the one I should bring on my wife because she is a certified sommelier. But when you're helping your wife through her exam, you start to pick up a few tidbits. Yeah. So really what you're looking for, like one of the things that Todd does really well is, you, you know, he's going to certify that wine. He, he will send off um, the wine samples to the lab. He'll be measuring um, the sugar content that is in that wine. So you can be sure it's going to be under like, I think it's 1.25 grams per deciliter. And that he always makes sure the alcohols are under 12.5. So now there are rules and regulations in the old world in France, and I like to go to a, from a, to a cooler climate wine. So we're talking wines from the Loire Valley or maybe from Chablis or even from the Champagne region. So first of all, when you look on, on a wine label, if you're like, say, purchasing a Chinon, which is a Cabernet Franc, you're going to look on the back and you want to try and keep the alcohol under 12.5. That's called like rule number one. Rule number two is most wines in France are done to the point of dry for the, white, from, or for the whites and for definitely for the reds. Be careful on some of the whites because you'll realize that some of them like to have uh, in certain regions a slightly sweeter version of it. But that's kind of like a little knowledge thing comes in play. But if you're going for like a Sauvignon Blanc from the Loire Valley, um, uh, that'll definitely be white. So like a Sancerre or, or a Fumi Blanc uh, will go really well. If you are going into Alsace region, if you do a Cremant de Alsace Brut, you will know that that is generally dry. Chablis is dry. Keep the alcohols low. And then if I'm going into Champagne, because my wife loves bubbles, I'll always go for, a, if I can, a Brut Nature or a Brut Sauvage. And they're the lowest of sugars in all of the Champagnes. If you're going for a Brut Extra Dry, that means extra sugar. Don't go for that. Don't mm. go for a Demi Sec. Um, uh, they're all the sweetness because interesting that champagne came to rise from the czars of France and um, uh, and that's how they were that we were uh, sorry the czars of, of Russia and France were serving them and they liked sweeter um, uh, wines and then when they came out with the Brut Nature or the Brut Sauvage they thought it was very savage of a wine in comparison to um, uh, to the demi sex that they were doing before. And that's why it was called Brut Sauvage. Um, but that's what I like, love to go for in that way. The, the uh, vernacular alone is just so juicy. You know, there's so many great words. Is it, is it our assumption then that me, most American wines are over sugared? Well, there's, that's the dirty little secret of the wine industry is that um, American reds, especially, they push the RS, that's what we call residual sugar. And, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my head on the block here. I think it's Robert Parker's fault. Robert Parker he has diabetes. And um, uh, he, um, he's the leading critic. And he's tasting wines for his palate. Well, his wine is like high alcohol, high sugared wines. And he's obviously using the wines that cater to 38% of Americans, 38% of Americans. Americans have diabetes. And then there's that whole 7.6 million people who have undiagnosed diabetes. And, you know, they like sweeter things. And so what happens is winemakers are making wine to please the critics. And their critics like sugary wines. And then they're pushing the RS to the bounds that you don't know. And with these higher alcohols, huge extraction of fruit, these big fruit bonds, you know, we're seeing cabs up into 15.1 as opposed to the, the reserve that you'll get from, uh, from, from, from France at 12.5. This is a huge amount of difference. And then there's the 76 different additives that a winemaker can put into wines, and you don't even know it on the label. Uh, deep purple and sawdust and, and other things and bits and bobs that you, a copper sulfate and enzymes and especially, you know, in a, in, a, in a good year, it's easy to make wine because Mother Nature's going to have it to you. But in a bad year, when you've got black mold and, and you've got all sorts of other things going on in your vineyard, then out will come with a bag of tricks of the enzymes and the rest of it. And you get, you'll get Frankenstein wine. And I think that we need to, the, the, the American public need to, have, uh, need to push for truth in labeling. We need to push to make sure that there is nutritional information on the back of a wine. Um, but there's going to be massive pushback on that, not only from the French governments, but from the from American governments. So personally right now, and I used to be a total locavore living in the Napa Valley, 
I very rarely drink Napa Valley wines. There are a few producers who I know because they're friends and I know what their white wines are like and I can do that because we've tested. Uh, there's a lovely little five acre plot of Saint Laurent down in Caneros. It's like you never see it anywhere else, but it's like they only make a few hundred um, uh, bottles of that and that's like delicious because it's very old world in its style. Because French have laws on how much they must yield per acre, that they cannot capitalize and add sugar and that you know the red wines will be dry. You can have more assurance that you won't get kicked out of ketosis, but your mileage may vary. I've been drinking wine for quite a long time. <laughs> Hopefully I've trained my liver, but I don't know about that one. But I do test before and after to see which wines are good and which wines are bad. But that, that's not my, my choice on it. But you can have a vital life. And I think that's the important thing. Don't forget that they think, oh, I'm on a diet. I, I look at it as a lifestyle. I sit down and I can have a small steak with a Bernay sauce, asparagus, a side of hollandaise sauce, some broccoli rabe with some olive oil, red pepper flakes on that. Have that with a nice chignon from the Loire Valley. Delicious. Well, mm. where, is, where is the, where is like, oh, I feel deprived here. I'm done. It's a great meal. And I can even go out and then we had Indian the other night as well. Just don't have the rice, don't have the naan bread and choose the, the butter masalas and the sag paneers and things like that. And you can still eat great ethnic food. You can go out and have wonderful carnitas tacos. Don't eat the taco. That's the garbage. That's just the, the, the disposable plate, if you will. Um, so there's lots of choices that is out there. And obviously, we were just in the south in, in Nashville. Great southern style cooking. There's some awesome restaurants that are out there for, and having different meats with dry rubs and great veggies. Um, I had an awesome time eating through Nashville. For those who don't know, what, what does dry farming mean and what's the advantage? So dry farming basically means is that uh, there's not an irrigation that is placed onto the vines. So, you know, there's two schools of thought that is on here. Um, you generally, when you're growing a vine, you want to make sure that you are, uh, uh, are trying to restrict the water to the vine. Um, so the vine will put down deeper roots so that you can have more of a flavor profile that will come on up to it. And then what you're also trying to do is make the actual clusters smaller. Because the smaller the cluster and the smaller the berries, the greater the skin to seed ratio and all the flavor, all the anthracyanins, all the polyphenols are in the skin. So you're looking to get, the idea will be the holy grail, like little BB gun pellet sized berries would be great. Not like these big berries, you want to have, have small berries. And so, you know, deliberately in the US, will restrict that water up until the point where they start to get shovel and then they will add just a small amount of water. That's irrigation that is allowed. But in France, you are not allowed to irrigate. And this comes actually back to some older wars. Like France was very concerned about Spain's wine industry. But Spain's wine industry could only grow through irrigation because it's such a dry, arid area. So by making European law make everything dry farm, it kept France's hold on the wine industry. So now there are some people that say dry farm is better because the roots will go down deeper. But then there are also the farmers who irrigate who say, if you are doing attention deficit irrigation, you can still have those deep roots, but you can then have the emergency that if you do need to water in a drought with global warming, you can have the opportunity. But if you put dry farm on your label and then you add water, now you've changed your marketing. And so here is the joy of um, uh, marketing and wine meeting uh, health. And that means it's education that is on that. And everybody's going to spin it their own way. <laughs> what we say around here, and I love your take on all of this, is that it has to be durable. We started off this interview by saying that the average American goes on five diets in a given year. Because one of the problems there is that all outcomes go to zero, right? If you say my goal for doing this diet is I'm going to lose 20 pounds, when you get from 200 to 180, then what? If your whole yeah. is to cross a finish line, but not create a lifestyle and something that's, that you can actually tolerate, then you're going to yo-yo. And there are some studies showing that that yo-yo and is actually more damaging than maintaining a homeostasis. To oh, a for sure. Yeah, I mean, wasn't it the classic, there was somebody did the Biggest Loser study where they looked at everybody on the Biggest Loser. And okay, you had, you had a nutritionist, you had a personal trainer, you had all of this stuff, and you still, they all rebounded back. They, they couldn't keep on it because what basically they were doing is the body was thinking that, hold on, they were in a famine. And so therefore, you know, they, they weren't, 
Dr. Robert Sews had a very interesting presentation and he, he was looking at carbohydrate addiction and alcohol addiction. Um, you know, with, um, you know, with alcohol, there's not an off switch. You have to say, I'm done. I'm going to walk away, but there's not a biofeedback that says I'm full. Like you can get from satiating food or proteins and fats together. Or like if you drink a lot of water, you go like, I'm no longer thirsty. There's a biofeedback. You don't get that with alcohol and you also don't get it with carbohydrates. And what I mean by that is like, I could open up a packet of milk chocolate hobnob um, cookies and I go, oh, I'll only have one with a cup of tea. And then the next thing I've known, I pile drive the entire packet in one sitting. Now, if you did the caloric load on that and I had in such a short space of time, that's, that's crazy. But there wasn't that feedback to say you're full and you're done. But if I sit down and have a nice dinner with a nice glass of wine with my, with my partner, and, um, uh, and it's a nice steak. They get to a point where they're like, oh, I, I can't eat anymore. And I leave it on the plate because the fat and the protein together gave that, that feedback to the brain and said, you're, you're done. And this is the problem that we see on these yo-yo diets is, you know, they're always going to be destined to lose because you, they haven't got in tune with eating the right way that allows you to, to live a, a good existence forward and get cheat? to the homeostasis. Do you have cheat days? How do you manage that? I, I very rarely cheat. No, I, I usually, uh, the toughest bit is like living in the Napa Valley when you've got some really great friends who have wineries and stuff and they go like, hey, come on over and we're going to cook pizza and then they hand make the dough and then they've got prosciutto and they've got mozzarella and, like, you go, and you go like, oh, why are you killing me here? And they're going to have a nice little burgundy and you're like, oh, you're, you're dying. So, uh, you know, I eat sensibly. Um, I am cognizant that where if there is going to be that moment and then the next morning I test and if I'm not in ketosis, I go like, okay, I'm just going to fast for a few hours. And now I'm so metabolically flexible, bomb, I'm, I'm back on in usually within, within a couple of hours from there. Most mornings I don't have breakfast or lunch. We just do about one meal a day. Um, so, but I don't deliberately set out to, to cheat. I don't think that that, that adds value um, personally there. Are, and I, and, but I want to be very clear on that there still needs to be more studies done. There aren't enough out there. Um, but personally for me, I just know that I'm, I'm in my personal zone between 1.1 and 1.7 and I'm, I'm happy to live, live that life in that way. Yeah, I'll underscore the comment about the need for more studies just with a few examples of high intensity athletes in my practice who have been very strict zero carb for several years now. Mm -hmm. And they have gut dysbiosis when we give them back some, some healthy complex carbs, there's a, there's a, I believe it's linked to butyrate that helps heal some of the leaky gut. So right. there, all of this um, is powerful, powerful tools. And just because it's not wrapped in a sexy pharmaceutical bottle or you know, a, a, a technology, doesn't mean that it, it, it shouldn't require sophisticated monitoring and guidance. And, um, I just can't thank you enough for coming on to share some of your insights, man. If we could hook you on again to talk about some of the testimonials, I know in Nashville, you were, you shared a few examples, but needless to say, we can all be encouraged that there's a very bright future um, about using prescriptive diets, some of the technologies you've created. And if people want to support your efforts and keto mojo and um, the foundation and, and the rides, how do we get people knit in so they can help be ambassadors for your mission? Um, well, that's a, a really great um, uh, question. Um, f first of all, go to ketomojo.com, sign up for a newsletter. You'll hear about all of our, our news and what we're trying to achieve. Obviously, we'll thank you if you want to buy our meter. Like, hey, that's always that's a, that's a wonderful. Bucks for 60 days, it can radically change your health trajectory. It's, it's like the greatest value going out there. Yeah, I mean, our, our goal is we're going to be reinvesting every single um, penny that we have. We partner with Heads Up Health so that you can track your data. I'm going to eventually be working with Chronometer to connecting with them so you can bring in all your macros and bring all of that stuff. Um, uh, that's our ultimate goal. And our goal is to get the tools so that people can change their lives so they can take control. And this is where we, we both came back to that same piece that is there. Um, I remember when my wife got her cancer diagnosis and we had an oncologist, a radiologist, um, uh, an integrative medicine. Uh, there was the uh, primary care physician. There was this entire team 
and we're constantly trying to like give new pieces of information and our goal is like how do we create it so that everybody gets that information at the same time how do we get the clear data sets that doctors can do their assess and address as you mentioned in, in the beginning there and that with this data clear decisions can be made for the best possible outcomes for that individual and i also want to come back there like there are genomic tests that you can do keto isn't right for everybody thank you for saying that keto is not right for everybody it works for me it works for a large propensity of people but there are some who are not destined for it because of their genetic snips that they have in place or they might have like other things that is going on with their microbiome that they need to address b beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like, don't think it's like this big hero. I mean, it's great. It's really good, but it's not everything for, for everyone. And let me interject there, Doran, that the, if, there, if there are any men listening out there and we have a huge men's health practice, I think one of the most overlooked and underdiagnosed uh, conditions out there among men in middle America is obstructive sleep apnea. And if you, if you have undiagnosed or undertreated obstructive sleep apnea, it's, it's proven scientifically that your ghrelin levels are much higher than they should be, which mm -hmm. is make it maddening for you to try to go keto. Yeah. If, if your internal thirst from grel, high ghrelin and low leptin, is, it, it drives increased quantity of foods and a craving for carbohydrates. Yeah. If, that kind of thing going on and your and your buddy at the gym is going keto so you're going to jump on keto you might actually hurt yourself definitely so i mean it's the personalization of medicine is the most important sort of thing and uh i think that as we we move down that way and we get the tools to be able to do that um we'll, we'll that's the better way to go um and not the one size fits all but that's the role of where um, doctors like yourself come on into play in in guidance and bringing the, bringing the voice of reason rather than just a business land like me. <laughs> well, it's, it's the collaboration between innovators who can bring the technologies to accelerate what I do in the clinic. It's that collaboration that is a hallmark of the front edge of medicine and it's the future. So doctors who might be listening to this, you've got to get on board. You've got to interface with the, the, the leaders of the technologies that you're bringing in the clinic and stop playing robots you know, and, and create this two-way dialogue. So, Dorian, I applaud you for, um, we didn't have enough time to give the entire backstory if we can get you back on. Absolutely, I'd love to. People would love to hear what it took in this new era to, to do what you said, which is take your wife, make a very um, serious personal decision to invest in a technology that the big boys just aren't producing. And that is moving a technology that I was introduced to about, four years ago with, and they, they were trying to sell me a device and it was $6 per strip. And I said to the vendor, like, I, I, I would love to try this, but I can't apply that to my practice. Nobody's going to pay six, $7 a strip. You've brought it down to $1 a strip. It's to be applauded. And I want to celebrate that journey more, but metaphorically what I see you doing and you giving me more thrust in my practice to do is to take that, sick hard candy shell off of people off of their brains off of their pancreas off of their muscles and their ability to you know sense glucose and insulin sensitivity and um get people living out the life they were meant to live that's the big mission the way i see it you you, you nailed it perfectly nothing as good as healthy feels but when you've walked you know i was walking around i lost 45 pounds i lost a sack of concrete Imagine your entire day walking around with a sack of concrete and how a person would feel. And this is where any doctor who has not been in that unhealthy state, can imagine having a sack or two sacks of concrete. It's really, really hard to live your life that way. And when you say taking off that exterior, I think together um, we, we can do that for a lot of people. Dorian, healing high five, buddy. Healing high five. Oh, right there. Love it. <laughs> uh, remember, go to ketomojo.com their newsletter and pay attention to that newsletter because i know this is just the tip of the iceberg for dorian's brain and his energy because this good stuff coming in the next six, in the yeah. next six months i really I and mean, we'll have to do it on the next one we'll tell you on the next one what's what's happening so there's some fun stuff cool thanks man enjoy napa today we'll talk to you soon all right cheers mate thank you